In this 10-year anniversary edition of Nintendo Unboxed, we're going to be taking a look at the Super Famicom. If you're interested in seeing my original unboxing for this console, you can click the link to it in the description for this video. So the Super Famicom here was, of course, Nintendo's 16-bit follow-up to the massively successful Famicom in Japan. And it was released there in 1990. It wouldn't uh, appear in other regions of the world until about a year later in 1991, but under a different name and uh, in the United States at least with a very different aesthetic. At this point, Nintendo was still um, creating their hardware with very different aesthetics from region to region and a different name. They wanted to keep Famicom in the name to let consumers know that this was the follow-up to the original Famicom. And over in the United States and in other parts of the world, they branded the console the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. They wanted to keep that Nintendo Entertainment System name as part of brand recognition. It wouldn't be until the Nintendo 64 where we saw uh, some unification between the naming and the aesthetic of the hardware that Nintendo was putting out. But something that would remain consistent uh, through most of the Super Famicom's life here was this kind of four-color aesthetic. And of course, the green, blue, yellow, and red buttons, those corresponded to the controllers. And uh, that was to let you know that, hey, this brand new controller with all these buttons is going to open up new worlds of gaming possibilities for you. So I think they wanted to make that a uh, very prominent part of the branding here. The multicolored buttons, the color scheme with the little logo here with Super Famicom. And then, of course, in the United States, at least, we would get different colored buttons. So that was not nearly as, as, as important of a marketing scheme. Uh, we got the lavender and the purple buttons. Kind of an interesting change in aesthetic. I myself prefer these multicolored buttons. But regardless, we've got the typical Nintendo branding and then Super Famicom as well as in Katakana. Super Famicom. Super Famicom. Those color aesthetics we're going to see also manifest in another part of the packaging here, which would be on the side panels. If we flip it to the first long panel, we've got blue, very plain. The first short side, we've got red. The next long side, we have green, along with a little bit of uh, an advisory here about the AC adapter and the RF switch. This would be one of the first consoles where Nintendo stopped packing in all of the things that you needed to hook it up and to power it. So no AC adapter and no RF switch with this Super Famicom. And I think the reasoning was that a lot of consumers would have already had a Famicom and they made a concerted effort, at least in Japan, to make the AC adapter and the RF switch backwards compatible with the new hardware. So if you already had a Famicom, uh, no need to go out and uh, buy these. But if you didn't, Super Famicom was your first video game system, you needed to get these. And then turning it over to the final short side here, you can probably guess the color, we've got yellow along with the, uh, the barcode. On the back here, nothing but a styrofoam block, which was pretty typical of Nintendo packaging in Japan at the time. Just a cardboard slipcase over the styrofoam block that kept the inner contents very safe inside. So let's see what we have once we pull off the cardboard cover here. Right away we can see we have some documentation. That typical uh, note about the AC adapter that was included with lots of hardware and even games uh, in Japan uh, with Nintendo products. The uh, instruction manual here that kind of kept in line with that four color aesthetic. So let's take a look at what we have in the instruction manual. Got a diagram of what's included with the system and uh, a Venn diagram here kind of showing you what is common between the Super Famicom and the original Famicom saying that you could use the AC adapter, the RF switch, and then of course the adapter if you needed to, uh, if your TV uh, had that kind of hookup with it. 
brand new with the Super Famicom was also a multi-AV out with uh, composite uh, video and stereo audio. They're not mentioning that too much here, but I'll show you the cable that I have for that. More diagrams of the different parts of the Super Famicom, including the EXT port that would be used for the Satellaview peripheral. How to hook your Super Famicom up to the TV using the RF switch. How to make the connections with the RF switch. Lots of different possibilities here. And again, they're even getting right down to stripping the coaxial wire, just like they did in the, uh, the Famicom manual. Very technical. Lots more instructions here about making the RF connection. There's all that technical stuff about how the coax wire works. And then here, the multi-AV cable. Uh, looks like... I've never seen this one in the United States. They've got a uh, composite video and mono audio, but they also have the composite video and stereo audio that we would get packed in with our Super Nintendo Entertainment System in the United States. So how to make that composite video connection. Even talking about S-Video, a little bit of an improvement here over the video quality and SCART which uh, we did not get in the United States. Uh, SCART, I think, was more of an Eastern uh, type of connection. Even how to hook your Super uh, Famicom and your Famicom up together using the same TV. You could only do that with the RF switch, unless, of course, you had multi-composite or S-Video or SCART inputs on your TV. But it was easy to daisy-chain RF switches together. And a bunch of text here, could be troubleshooting, maybe a parts order form, that's typically what this uh, portion of the manual was reserved for. And then on the back cover here, information to, uh, spaces to put the information from where you bought it. And then of course the serial number sticker there, uh, which should match the one that's on the bottom of your console. This one that starts with SM gives us kind of an indication that this is a late model Super Famicom. So inside it's going to have the onboard audio. Lots of modifications had been done by this point uh, to the uh, actual internals. So I think this is one of the uh, final runs of the Super Famicom. But I've got an older one here that we can take a look at and make some comparisons with. But before we get to that, Let's take a look and see what else is in the box. Not too much. We've got our two controllers at least. Something that was new or at least different between the uh, Famicom and the Super Famicom was the concept of detachable controllers. We saw in my Famicom unboxing video that the two controllers were hardwired to the system with a very short cable. And you do still get a very short cable here, however, you have the option to disconnect your controllers. A little bit of a difference here, you can see through the plastic with the R and L shoulder buttons. The R and L are kind of embossed into the plastic. You would see this on the later models of the controller. That was most likely a cost-saving measure. The older models of the controller, which I have one here, you can see that the R and the L were actually silk screened or painted onto the plastic there. And I much prefer that. I think that gives it a much nicer look than the, than the embossed R and L. But that's kind of a difference there between the older and the newer controller. So with the Super Famicom, you got two controllers and you got your console. And that's pretty much it. So we'll take a look at the Super Famicom. Take it out of its bag. Now this Japanese version has a much different aesthetic and I much prefer this aesthetic to the one that we got for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in the United States. Just more curvy, a little bit more sleek. Ours was quite boxy. And of course, like I mentioned, I prefer the four color scheme, four color scheme there than the uh, the lavender and the purple that we got. 
So use cassette with Super Famicom Mark only. So basically use only cassettes or cartridges that were designed for the Super Famicom. I happen to have one here for Super Mario Kart. This is what they looked like. Love the aesthetic of the cartridge, aside from the fact that they did not have end labels, unfortunately. A convention we would see continue on with the N64. But all you need to do is put your cartridge in, and then you could switch the power on. There's a reset button and the eject mechanism, which this would be the last time we would see that on a Nintendo home console for easy removal. No reason why you can't just use your hand, like with the Sega Genesis or Atari, but Nintendo seemed to like to include an eject mechanism. In the United States, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System had a mechanism where when you turn the power on, a piece of plastic would slide out and lock in to a corresponding slot on the cartridge to keep it locked in the system so you couldn't uh, eject it while the system was on. And we would see that uh, mechanism throughout the entire lifespan of the Super Famicom. Like I mentioned, this is a late model Super Famicom. But uh, in the United States, that mechanism was label, uh, later defeated through a redesign of the cartridge. And we'll take a look at that in my unboxing for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. But interesting that uh, in Japan, there was no problem with this cartridge lock mechanism. Whereas in the United States, they uh, decided to, to eliminate it. When you did turn this on, a red LED would light up here where it says power. Got a plate here with the Super Famicom logo. Two controller ports labeled one and two. A grill for venting. On the side there, nothing going on on either one. But on the back, we've got the power in and then the audio video out. This port right here was for RF, and in Japan, the radio frequency would broadcast over channel 1 or channel 2. And you would move this selector switch to select the channel where you got the best reception. It varied from TV to TV. New to the Super Famicom was the multi-out, where you would connect either a composite video and stereo audio, or as we saw in the instruction manual, composite video or mono audio cable. Or, like the packaging that I have here, remember you had to buy all of these separately for the Super Famicom, uh, this is the S-Video cable. So, Nintendo's proprietary uh, jack right there and then it would split off into the white and red stereo audio and then this is the connector for S video so this is an example of the packaging that you would see these cables in in a retail store in Japan and then on the back panel it shows you how to make those connections to the Super Famicom and then to your TV so that was a nice feature there to have an upgrade for your audio and video signal for your new 16-bit console Turning it over to the back here, we've got the cover for the EXT port. We've got some stickers here with model information and then the serial number. Of course, you wanted to be sure that your serial number matched, so we've got SM1118752. So that matches. And like I mentioned, uh, this is a newer Super Famicom. One of the ways that you can tell, well, number one, there isn't too much yellowing going on. The Super Famicom and the Super Nintendo is notorious uh, for having the plastic yellow. And I believe that was due to a chemical called bromine or bromine that is a uh, flame retardant chemical that was added to the mix in the plastic. And when it's exposed to UV light over the years, it tends to yellow. And that process is reversible, but it takes a lot of work. But it's worth looking into because not only does the plastic yellow, but it also becomes brittle and will crack. So we'll take a look at that uh, in the other Super Famicom that I have here. This one hasn't yellowed quite as much on the top except for the nameplate. It's on the bottom and on the controller module that you're going to see a lot of the yellowing here. So you can see that 
different parts of the console, uh, they were made with different mixes of plastic that had, I don't know, lesser amounts of the bromine or maybe um, uh, bromine that wasn't quite as prone to yellowing. Not quite sure why we see those variations as much, but I also have a Super Famicom that's just yellow all over and so yellow it almost looks brown. But um, that's something that if you see a a uh, Famicom, Super Famicom, which is old, but it's not yellowed. It might be one of the uh, the newer ones. And another way uh, you can tell is the really old ones. They will have four rubber feet instead of the two plastic ones on the back. So there you have the Super Famicom. I hope that you've enjoyed this unboxing video and we'll stick around at World of Nintendo for lots more content that I have coming, especially the 10 year anniversary editions of the unboxing series in which I'm reshooting some of my original unboxings that could stand to have a little bit of an upgrade in the video quality. So up on the screen here I've had the, uh, the calendar of how those are going to be released throughout the year. So until the next one, Take care.